What's up everybody, Steven Z Killer here, and I'm bringing you a brand new reaction video. But before that, about 80% of you guys watching are not subscribed! That means two things, either you're new or you're returning, and hopefully this is the video that gets you that subscribe button today! The new goal for this channel is 400,000 subscribers, and the only way we can do that is by you right there hitting that subscribe button. I can feel it rising. I can feel it. Oh, keep hitting the subscribe button. Keep doing it. One day we'll even go even further beyond and hit a million subscribers. So hit that subscribe button today. What's up, everybody? Steven Kelly here, bringing another reaction, and today we're checking out the finale, I believe. Because, honestly, I don't know if they're going to be making a part four with how the last part ended. Um, Because I think they're diving into VR and uh, probably Security Breach in this one. And maybe even the Security Breach DLC. And that's pretty much caught... Oh, you know, I guess there is also VR 2. There's still probably going to be a chance for a part four, but I don't know how likely that is. I'm excited for part three, though. If you haven't seen the uh, undeniably canon Five Nights at Freddy's timeline series I've been watching, I just dropped part two earlier uh, today, and I dropped part one yesterday. But if you're watching this at some other point, you can find all three on the channel if you guys want. I highly recommend you guys do. Also, I've been absolutely loving this fucking wacky and beyond what the fuck uh, story. So I'm excited to get into this. Uh, if you guys haven't already, please show your support by subscribing to this channel like I have and hitting that like button. This dropped only a few days ago. Let's get into this. And also, tomorrow is Halloween! Today is the last day of normal October, but tomorrow is Halloween. I'm so excited. Don't miss out on tomorrow's Halloween stream. And of course, if you're watching this after October 31st, then you already missed the Halloween stream. But don't worry. Hit that subscribe button. Don't miss out on the future stuff and future live streams and all that good stuff. So don't miss out. And uh, let's get into this and enjoy it right now. Long time no see. Are you ready to continue? What are you doing? Uh I like reading. Don't spoil yourself. Allow me to do the hunt. Oh, that's right. Wait, wait, wait. There's also possibly that uh, he teased the fact that I think Eleanor was at the end of the last one. So we might be getting to some of the book stuff. Like To Be Beautiful, um, Count the Ways, Fetch, whatnot. All those stories. Hard work for you. And continue the most undeniably canon FNAF timeline you'll ever hear. Oh. 1985. William Afton, after a long day's work and a five-minute murder spree, decided to head <laughs> back out to the dining area of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and stand around like nothing happened. However, the entire restaurant was in a panic, as one of the customers caught sight of Henry doing that blank stare thing again. William decided this was the perfect time. Hey, thank you for subscribing. If your name pops up, get a shout out. Thank you. Appreciate you. Perfect time to finally confront Henry about the five dollars he was owed, but out of the corner of his eye, he saw a suspicious boy jump out of the ball pit. William had seen this kid before. They're going to be doing Into the Pit, okay. Before, socializing with some regulars in recent weeks. He wasn't typically one to speculate what the patrons were up to, but he strongly felt something was up with this boy in particular. So, he decided to traumatize him for kicks. Okay, so wait. This is going to be possibly going into more of the book stuff than the V... Maybe a little bit of the VR, because they did kind of show a little bit of VR stuff, and I even think the thumbnail had, like... Um, it looked like it had Vanny on it. And giggles. William lured the child to the safe room and graced him with the sight of all the freshly stuffed missing children. Duh. Being reasonably horrified at this, made a mad dash back to the ball pit. As run, motherfucker, run! <laughs> Once he dove back in, though, William decided it wasn't worth the trouble of going any further. That ball pit was not pleasant. So, William was just about ready to forfeit the chase until the ball pit lit up. William realized there was something much more mysterious about this than meets the eye, so he decided to come back to it after making some preparations. The next morning, he got dressed for a potential vacation destination, staged a photo shoot to let Henry have a vague idea of where he was, and donned the spring bonnie suit before plunging into the pit. 
Okay, yeah, we're definitely... Oh, yep, 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 we are getting... What the fuck? Oh, the FNAF AR. Yeah, yeah, the phone thingy, yeah, yeah. The year is 2023. There is a good chance that there might be a part four next year. I, I Or at some point. I don't think we'll get a part four anytime soon, but there is a good chance we could have a part four next October or something like that. Oswald, the boy that had taken advantage of a time-traveling vault... Have all these actually come out in October, actually? I just realized. Because the, the part two was a year ago, and part three, uh, part one was two years ago. I'm assuming these are, like, maybe an October thing for the channel. Hit ...in a shady pizzeria named Jeff's for the past few weeks. Suddenly emerged from it in a panic to be greeted by his confused and upset father. Before his dad could give him a stern talking to, though, William Afton caught him by surprise and dragged him down the depths of the dingy... Come here, motherfucker! Himself out. William was taken <laughs> aback at how easily he caught up to Oswald, but figured there must have been some inexplicable time dilation that made things more convenient. With all that settled, William True. took Oswald out of the pizzeria, discovered what a GPS was, and took the boy home. Although he was fascinated by his surroundings, he couldn't fully take it all in. He was too focused on the bit. Once they arrived at the house, he sneakily bribed Oswald's mother to play along with this until further notice. <laughs> After Oswald fell asleep, William decided he felt like snooping in his belongings for the heck of it. After sifting through pages of one of the boy's notebooks, he found drawings of the old Freddy's mascots accompanied by various attempts at characters he didn't recognize. William's curiosity of what this was supposed to look like was enough to inspire him, so he grabbed some spare junk from the garage and began working on a new animatronic to see what would happen. Overnight, William's mess of parts somehow turned into a fully polished masterpiece. However, upon seeing he had created nothing but a conventionally attractive female character, William immediately lost interest, <laughs> so he threw her in the trash before going to Wow! Sleep. The next day, Oswald decided to rescue his father before it was too late. Although William tried his best to stop the boy... I actually really like this. They're, they're trying to... Uh, he's really going all his, out of his way to make the... Um, well, th they are technically still canon stories to... FNAF, but it's like it's a little bit more complicated but he's making sense of into the pit is the reason William Afton's there and he comes to basically the future he builds Eleanor but he doesn't care about Eleanor so she gets thrown away into the dump and then the little girl finds Eleanor and all that shit happens okay I, I, I like it Oswald managed to knock him back William, disoriented, clumsily stumbled into a net and hung himself before Oswald and his dad safely escaped. Fortunately, we know that's not how he's going to die. Poor structural integrity came to the suffocating William's rescue. The ball pit's net snapped, launched William down and out the ball pit, and he skyrocketed back into the Freddy's parking lot in 1985 as if nothing happened. Uh. Meanwhile, in 2023, local entrepreneur Michael Afton finally organized all of his plans for the revival of Fazbear Entertainment. He wasn't quite at the point he was hoping for, though, thanks to Hurricane City Council catching that all of his documents showing their approval for different... Ooh, also, wait, I just realized he could also do, like, the canon stuff with the Silver Eyes, the Twisted Ones, the Four Door Story, that kind of stuff. That'd be sick, too. Projects with forged signatures. Normally, they'd let this kind of thing slide, but they all had unanimous beef with Freddy's and seemingly had a means to shut Michael's plans down. Yeah, the government is probably not happy with uh, William Afton, especially since in part one he threatened them and was successful. Upon the discovery of training tapes of the wreckage of its most recent disaster, it was made apparent that the company was meant to be finished off for good. Knowing his good looks couldn't get him out of this one, Michael mm. thought of a more practical solution to this problem. So, he quickly tampered with the tapes while nobody was looking. Pardon me, but if you wouldn't mind re-watching this tape... I do believe you'll find yourselves to be mistaken about the state of the company. There is a need for you to return to work next week, as Fazbear Entertainment is a corporate entity. The city council's hands were tied by this indisputable evidence, and they begrudgingly allowed Michael to continue his business ventures, as long as Damn. he didn't immediately build a giant building over half the town. So, with that... Yeah, Michael decided to buy out Jeff's pizzeria, since it was a oh! crudely repurposed Freddy's location anyway. Using blueprints left in the office, Mike made near-perfect recreations of the classic animatronics. Everything was looking up for Michael, and his efforts rewarded him with massive success. Ah, we're back in... Th now this is what we have from FNAF 1. Yes. Hearing the cacophony of customers at Freddy's every day made Mike confident in the pizzeria, and now he wanted to pursue a more personal project. After scouting out local scientists, he kidnapped Phineas Taggart to assist him in a new product for Fat Who? Entertainment. 
Michael described his vision to Taggart. A mar okay, if that's an actual person from like maybe the book series, I have no idea who the fuck that is. I don't recognize the name whatsoever. A substance that could violently clone and replace anyone it touched. When questioned why he wanted to create such a thing, Michael simply brushed it off as necessary trauma, much like what he had to go through to become a successful entrepreneur. Okay. Okay. But why do we need to make Faz goo specifically? It will build character. Okay, this is definitely something from one of the books. Character. Taggart was some. I remember the I remember the phrase Faz goo, uh, from like a film theory and whatnot, but How that, that's about it. Answer. And after 26 and a half minutes, he had developed the first ever sample of Fazgu. Michael was ecstatic at the sight of this creation, but he needed to be sure it worked. Before he could dismiss Taggart, though, the scientist begged him for payment. Mike did not want to give actual money to this guy. <gasps> He's gonna make fit uh, the fetched little dog! So he just tossed him a robot dog and kicked him out. Meanwhile, the rejected animatronic from William Afton's vacation had been hauled to the dump. After a while, a stray soul discovered it and decided to call it home. This turned out to be William's ex-wife, Eleanor Schmidt, who had been kicked out of Molten Freddy during Henry Emily's final blaze of glory. Oh, oh. So she's in... What? Okay. Glory. The children inhabiting the animatronic mass voted that Eleanor didn't deserve to move on with them, so they quickly ejected her so she'd be stuck in this plane of existence indefinitely. After recollecting herself after all this time spent sitting in the... So Ballora... Uh, Ballora, a.k.a. Eleanor soul i guess went into that and became eleanor to in the to be beautiful all right all right the backseat of ennard she gathered that this animatronic had no discernible characterization prior to her possession so having the full jurisdiction to present as any name she pleased she decided to just go by eleanor while adjusting to her new body eleanor realized that her dress had a feature she only thought was possible in her wildest dreams it had pockets she needed to make use of these immediately, so she quickly looked around <laughs> the junkyard for something worthy to put inside them. Her eyes were drawn to a pile of strange discs within the trunk of an old car, so Eleanor went ahead and grabbed them. Upon taking them, however, the sound waves these discs emitted granted her with cosmic power beyond her human understanding. Eleanor, realizing she could do anything she desired, immediately teleported to her old accounting firm expecting to get right back to work. Wait, so wait, did Eleanor actually have... Oh, that would make sense because in the story to be beautiful, she's literally ripping the little the girl the, the little girl that found her. She's ripping out organs, bones, and all that other stuff, and she's placing mechanical pieces in there and she just seems to be instantly healed. Uh, and a bunch of other things not knowing, but it's really a, one of those discs things in the necklace she was given. Her old boss was bewildered at the sight of her again and grimly told her she was laid off and replaced 38 years prior. She did not take this news well. Filled with sudden rage, Eleanor killed her former boss and was quickly enamored. Well, that was a... I don't think that was called for! ...by the power his agony fueled her with. She became obsessed with feeding on more of this, so she started plotting what to do next. <laughs> Now holding a grudge against basically any businessman at this point, she targeted every major corporation she could think of. <gasps> is that are they going to go the route where they're because this is a, this is a theory people have been speculating and whatnot um, that William Afton's wife is the owner or head developer or head owner of the developing company that made the Five Nights at Freddy's VR. Is that where they're going to go with this? Good and obliterated all of the people in charge of them. Now filled with triple the infinite power she had already, Eleanor was ready to claim what the fuck? greatest evil the world has ever known. To her surprise, though, basically everyone on Earth that was subjected to these corporations was happy about their immediate quality of life boosts, and Eleanor was hailed as a benevolent revolutionary, siphoning the agony right <laughs> out of her with their collective joy. Becoming the hero of the working class was not what Eleanor had in mind. Although she kind of enjoyed the respect, that didn't do anything for her newfound hunger, and she needed to cause more problems. To avoid repeating the same mistake as before, she decided to keep things local. Drawing inspiration from how her ex-husband managed to discover Remnant, she warped to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza to do what William did, but better. However, as she approached the front door, Michael caught sight of her and immediately grew suspicious. Who are you, and what are you doing here? It's me, your mother. No hard feelings about the stupid incident, right? Matter. That's not how you introduce yourself. That's so fucked. I'm here to massacre all of your patrons for 
personal satisfaction. How predictable. Being called out on the spot like that really got under her. Damn! Up. She would have murdered Michael out of spite in any other circumstance, but given she did owe him after the scooping incident, she let this personal attack slide. Eleanor needed to prove Mike wrong, though, so she decided to pull ass nine stunts nobody would ever think to do. After that, an unlucky child just so happened to pass by Eleanor's line of sight, and Eleanor decided this kid was the perfect first victim to truly test her power. A child named Sarah was minding her own business as Eleanor followed her closely. As Sarah approached the suspiciously plot-relevant dump, Eleanor warped to the trunk she found before for the girl to notice her. Sarah was incredibly transfixed with the animatronics' beauty and excitedly carried yep. her home. Yep, now we're in the story of To Be Beautiful. At night, Eleanor figured this would be the perfect time to activate and begin her plan. She promised Sarah that she could make her wildest dream come true, to be beautiful. Sarah, not understanding that she was perfectly fine the way she was, immediately agreed to this proposal. However, Eleanor told her she needed to forever wear her pendant for this to work. Over the next several days, Sarah was completely transformed. She became much more popular, much more confident in her looks, and much more paranoid that something would go wrong. And go wrong, something did. With just one slip on a comically placed banana peel, Eleanor's pendant flew right off of Sarah's neck. To Sarah's terror, yep. Eleanor was actually replacing her body with chunks of scrap metal, and the pendant was all that kept her hollow metallic membrane together. Sarah desperately ran back home to try and beg for Eleanor's help, to which the animatronic welcomed her by shifting into a look-alike of the girl's original body. Had she survived, Sarah may have gleaned some sort of moral from this whole ordeal, but unfortunately she had completely fallen apart into a miserable pile of scraps. Eleanor retrieved her pendant, now charged with terrible agony once again. With this boost in power, she was ready to take on Damn, that's fucked! the entire population of Hurricane <laughs> in increasingly strange and specific God damn it, Balloon Boy, what are you doing back here? Ways. <laughs> Meanwhile, Phineas Taggart was on a personal hunt for random junk. This particular night led him to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place, now in a sinkhole, where William Afton and Andrew just sat around playing Uno. Andrew's <laughs> anger at William had settled quite a bit. All he had to do was scream into some trash, and soon enough he hadn't a clue why he was mad in the first place. Unfortunately, the trespassing Taggart wound up interrupting their game and slammed his robot dog onto Andrew's spirit, tethering his remnant to the toy's battery. William What? Looked up at the man in mild distress. His spirit is in fetch? Stress. To avoid being tackled, tased, or anything else, he hastily got up and followed the man wherever he was going. On that note, Taggart arrived at his lab with his new trinkets, an Andrew-infested fetch and William Afton. Taggart didn't initially plan on anything special for the junk he was collecting, but finding a stray soul in an animatronic zombie truly motivated him to try and do something spectacular with it all. To his amusement, said zombie was absolutely hideous, and Taggart just had to make William's unsightliness known to him. Oh, please. I could have looked faster. Terrified <laughs> inside of his suit being horrendously... Wow, I guess this is the first time he actually sees how he looked? Burton broken, William accidentally death stared his reflection and he exploded. Taggart, delighted by the sudden what? haunted gunk all over his treasures, decided to take advantage of this and mash them all together into a new creation. This new animatronic not what only the fuck? merged the souls of William and Andrew into one body, it also introduced a third spirit into the mix. This was a child named Jake, whose death shockingly had nothing to do with Afton or Freddy's. With his good temperament compared to the other two, he got to pilot the animatronic while William and Andrew were stuck being backseat drivers. Oh, is this going to be the Stitch Wraith? Taggart was delighted at his living Stitch Wraith, but his joy- It is. Okay, okay. It was short-lived as William convinced Jake to slap the mad scientist. As it turned out, Afton's presence within the animatronic killed Phineas Taggart on the spot. Jake was absolutely okay. So that's where he is probably from. I don't know too much about the Stitch Wraith, but I do. I'm assuming that in the book, he, that person is the creator of uh, of that. Horrified about this, but Andrew wasn't particularly bothered about it. After surveying the damage, they deduced that they should just wait for someone else to handle it. So they sat there and waited until a garbage collector found them. Sure enough, though, the mere touch of the Stitch Wraith was all it took to kill this guy too. Immediately, Jake what? realized who was responsible for this. William had already been giving off bad vibes, but now he looked blatantly proud of himself. When Jake tried to explain this, though, Andrew came to William's defense. What's so bad about him? He cheated at Uno once. He literally killed two people just now! Lies and slander. No, no, I did do that. That's what I'm What? <laughs> he even said I did do that! In fact, I killed you too. I think I'd remember being murdered. 
All right, he's just a dumbass at this point. Jake needed to solve this fast. After some internal bickering, he learned about Andrew screaming into stuff to release his rage. With that information, Jake reasoned that putting those pieces back together could potentially refresh Andrew's memory. He'd remember why William was a problem, and they could finally get rid of the purple parasite. After a few weeks of running around on a garbage hunt, and with only a few extra casualties... THEY MURDERED LUIGI! The drape headed to an abandoned factory to use its trash compactor on its collection. Suddenly, intruding on the scene was Detective Everett Larson, who had been tracking down the stitch rate this entire time to try and cope with this divorce or something. As Larson prepared to shoot it down, Jake suddenly caught notice of him and backflipped into the trash compactor in an act of defiance. As the stitch wraith crumpled together with all the junk, Andrew finally remembered what he was so angry at William Afton about. He was just about ready to throw hands with his killer once more, but he quickly gathered he may have been out of his league. After the Stitch Wraith flipped into the trash heap, William's soul transferred to the garbage and began forging it all together into a new body. After causing a chain reaction with the old machinery, William blew up the factory and used its debris to his advantage, growing into a 15-foot tall monstrosity. WHAT THE FUCK?! I don't remember any of this stuff! So, making the decision to cut his losses, Andrew quietly made a run for it while he still could. Larson <laughs> was shocked at how dramatically the situation escalated, spent this- Who the fuck is behind the cop? Hold up, go back? No. Go back. It's valuable to oh, well, he still could. What is that? Who is that? Good. Larson, shocked at how dramatically the situation escalated. Who are you? Spent this valuable time throwing insults at the giant trash rabbit. William wasn't phased by this, though, and simply- <laughs> Giant trash rabbit. Not wrong. Claimed. <laughs> that is actually really sick and creepy art. Somebody say agony. Oh, that was Eleanor. Eleanor was there too, apparently. After learning of the Afton Amalgamation's existence, she quickly launched herself into it to try and absorb its power. This caused Afton to become far more violent, and Larson was nearly killed by the Amalgamation. Before it could finish him okay. off, he began hearing a voice coming from his bag. It was the mask of the puppet, or at least his delirious mind figured it must have been. Nonetheless, he tossed it at Afton's shins, and the impact caused him to fall apart like a- ALWAYS THE SHINS! ...house of cards. As Afton sank into the lake near the wreckage, he noticed Eleanor escaping his collapsing body, and he recognized her instantly. Not only was she his abandoned creation from his time travel vacation, he felt the spite emanating from her, and knew it could be only one person. The woman who he once probably loved, then definitely hated, had managed to become far more than he ever was. And so, he looked at her in bittersweet longing before everything faded to black. William Afton was dead. Now that the amalgamation was destroyed, the Stitch Wraith ran to Larson's aid. Jake was all on his own now, and he wasn't going to let anyone else die. So, he whacked the detective with his battery, and that got rid of the lingering agony left behind by Afton. Now that Larson was a little less half-dead than before, he immediately <laughs> tried to fight Eleanor. She wasn't impressed by his endeavor, and she dragged him into a highlight reel inside her mind. Your investigations, your hunt for the Stitch Wraith, your failed marriage. Who do you think was behind it all? A uh, bad luck, I guess. Oh, I thought I was being more obvious. Sorry, sorry. Anyway... It was me all along. <laughs> what a bitch! You didn't know it, Larson, but I was always there. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? The truth revealed to him by this master of disguise immediately shot Eleanor four times in a row. This managed. I <laughs> like how we have all different versions. To him by this master of disguise immediately shot Eleanor four times. Like that one. That's probably the one we most iconically know because of like uh, music animations and whatnot. This managed to disorient her enough to warp to another memory, where Larson then grabbed a baseball bat and bashed her head off. This went on in a loop for a while. We could Damn! Her, but also not accomplishing too much otherwise. From an outsider's perspective, Larson and Eleanor just stayed in one place silently. The Stitch Wraith was bored of waiting, so Jake decided to see what would happen if he tried to interact with Eleanor without Afton infecting his touch. This allowed the Stitch Wraith to peer into her memories. While Larson and Eleanor were still having their grand battle, Jake discovered Eleanor's worst memory. 
I have Billy D. Williams who's in this one. Oops. Spoiler. Confused by what the problem here was, but nonetheless undeterred, the Stitch Wraith grabbed Eleanor and launched her into the memory to be stuck forever. <laughs> the Smash Bros. sound effect, I recognize that. That Jake had saved the planet from Eleanor's wrath, he felt fulfilled in his purpose. With that, he moved on from this world, and the Stitch Wraith was no more. Larson, now sitting alone in the wreckage of a factory with two lifeless animatronics in front of him, deliberated what to do now. He knew this was going to cause a big stink for the police department if he didn't have a believable explanation on hand. So he just tossed Eleanor and the Stitch Wraith's bodies into the ball pit at Freddy's and blamed their hijinks on fast for entertainment. Michael Lafton, Damn. facing immense backlash for reviving the company, had to figure out a way to save its reputation before it collapsed all over again. He checked his plans for anything that could help him, and to his relief, there was a per Video game cover-up lawsuits? We need to hire new staff. That looks like possibly a, ske a prototype sketch of uh, Rox uh, Roxanne Wolf. Perfect solution. All Mike had to do was cover. Also, up. the lightning bolt there for a uh, rock, a uh, glam rock, not rock star, glam rock, uh, Freddy and glam rock, uh, Roxanne. These allegations by touting them as fictional events from a video game series. After interrogating his board of directors to see if any of them knew how to make a game, one of them spoke up and said they knew of someone that could. This led Michael to a failed indie developer with a desolate hope for success, Steve Snodgrass. Steve's only claim to fame was a critically panned promotional title for Elf Chips, but Mike could feel the potential oozing from this creator. Steve 99% off. And Michael gave him lightning. Steve, ecstatic at the opportunity to make appropriate use of his uncanny modeling style, quickly whipped up a game called Five Nights at Freddy's. It was pretty simple, but Michael thought it was a perfect starting point. After Steve posted this game under the guise that it was totally unauthorized, it immediately skyrocketed in popularity. People were playing it left and right, and most importantly, those curious- <laughs> It's Markiplier! And I think that's supposed to... be... Um... Why am I blanking on this motherfucker's name? Corey. It's about the game's hidden lore started to confuse- MAD PAT! <laughs> ...historical fact from modern fiction. Michael needed Steve to make a sequel, fast. Steve then churned out two more in only a couple days to resounding success. Mike realized quickly, though, that these games weren't actually helping with the current controversy the company was facing. Whatever skeletons were once in Henry's closet were of no concern to him. So Mike decided to assassinate Steve Snodgrass and cover up his death with a fan-made spin-off title. With that taken care of, Mike quickly commissioned an anthology book series to spoof recent incidents with Eleanor and the Stitch Wraith. Despite <laughs> the fact everyone knew about these public menaces, the prospect of reading about them made the public immediately stop caring. All Michael Who wants to fucking read? <laughs> to tie it all back together by framing Steve Snodgrass as some random lunatic trying to deface his brand. So, he commissioned a studio called Silver Parasol to make a virtual reality game that cemented all of the rumors of Fazbear Entertainment as nothing more than fiction. Development was pretty standard, all things considered. The now we're in the VR segment. All three of the original FNAF games in VR, and then Michael personally provided them with scribblings of his own life experiences to use as inspiration for new levels. Alongside this, he also tossed them various circuit boards, notably from Scrap Trap and some old Dendo Skeleton hardware. He told the developers that it helped make the characters perform in Pathfind or authentically in game, to which everyone collectively told him that's not how it works. After some gentle <laughs> negotiation, Michael convinced- Oh, he brought a gun out! <laughs> what the fuck? This didn't seem to really accomplish anything initially, but soon something awakened within the VR game that nobody yet knew about. William Afton, against all odds, came back from complete eradication again due to lingering remnant on Scrap Trap circuit boards possessing a program called Mimic One. Observing the virtual space around him, William started digging through files to obtain a more tangible form. To his disappointment, he wasn't all too pleased with any of the Spring Bonnie or Spring Trap models available to him. So, instead, William used the power of 3D modeling software to manifest a digital recreation of his wonderful pajamas. To save his new form, he overwrote an unused Spring Trap model named Glitch Trap and decided that worked perfectly for his new environment. He was considering the name Malhair, but he had no idea how to rename the files, so he just settled with what he had. As production continued and beta tests began, Glitch Trap encountered Jeremy Fitzgerald II, the security guard. Yeah, that was another. That, I like how that was a play on things because I, I believe in the. Um, it's it was like in an interview I watched a while ago with Scott and stuff. Uh, he said that 
the the leaked name scrap trap wasn't actually supposed to be the name for scrap trap or no a glitch trap not no, sorry glitch traps name wasn't supposed to be glitch trap but because it leaked and a lot of people liked it they just stuck with it would shoot on ones now working as a QA tester, what? Gerald the second, the security guard balloon boy chewed on ones. Now working as oh, a QA wow. tester, Jeremy tried to write off glitch trap as nothing more than a bug. As time went on, though, he wound up being captivated by the virtual rabbit rattling off nitpicks about the game's character models and level maps. Jeremy agreed that this was a problem. <laughs> he promised glitch trap that he'd set things right and make the VR game as accurate as he could. The other developers, however, felt insulted by the sudden onslaught of criticism Jeremy provided. None of it seemed rational or helpful, so they all conspired to get rid of him. After finding a guillotine paper Damn! Cut, the silver parasol development team cut off Jeremy's face and made it What the fuck? Look like he did it in a fit of hysteria. Jeremy didn't really appreciate this, so he finally quit his job as And he survived! As a QA tester and sued Silver Parasol for cutting off his face. With his position now open, a successor dubiously named Tape Girl took his place. Tape Girl, Tape. much like Jeremy. Oh my god, Tape Girl's gonna be the daughter of Phone Dude! <laughs> ...was also unusually intertwined with the history of Fazbear Entertainment. Her brother, Phone Dude, had sucked her- Oh, it's her- She- Okay. Alright, all right, I was close. I thought it was gonna be the daughter, but no, it's the sister. ...to a passionate interest in the company while he constructed Fazbear's Fright. Now that he had gone missing, she decided to pick up his slack and participate in- And she is the one that's gonna be, um, uh... Vanessa, technically. The company's current runner. Calling it right now. Glitchtrap, upon seeing Tape Girl, recognized her as one of Phone Guy's children and reasoned that she wasn't to be trusted. He had been burned by both her father and brother already, and he wasn't going to let that happen again. So, Glitchtrap went out of his way to freak her out as much as possible while she tried to beta test the game. Becoming terrified of this anomaly, and discovering that Silver Parasol was shutting down due to Jeremy's lawsuit, she hastily began to record audio logs documenting Glitchtrap's presence and other details that could help whatever QA tester replaced her. As she continued attempting to delete the anomaly from the game, Glitchtrap devised a plan to attach himself to her virtual tapes in order to prevent her from killing him. By the time she figured this out, it was too late. So she hid the audio files across the game as well as she could before development was switched over. Glitchtrap wasn't going to let Tape Girl go that easy though. So on her last day on the job, he created a brand new level meant just for her. As Tape Girl followed his bunny trail, she soon realized that he was the one responsible for the murders that plagued Freddy's all along. I always Feeling come more back. More tangled within the virtual reality, Tape Girl soon found herself trapped within the suit of Freddy Fazbear as Glitchtrap celebrated her digital demise. Now that Silver Parasol was no longer developing the Fazbear virtual experience, Michael wiped all known traces of the company and its employees from existence. The replacement studio was run to Just is so much casual murder going around! ...directly by Fazbear Entertainment, and they sent out some help- And once again, this all started because of five fucking dollars! ...wanted ads to get fresh beta testers. Soon enough, a new hire caught wind of the job opportunity and applied as soon as possible. This applicant was a passionate Five Nights at Freddy's fan named Vanessa Shelley. Vanessa was extreme. Okay, I guess I was wrong. I thought I thought uh, uh, Cassette Girl was going to be Vanessa. Extremely excited to get the chance to test a brand new FNAF game. She wasn't confident that the new studio would uphold the franchise's integrity from the Snodgrass trilogy, but she chose hmm. to be optimistic. After putting on the headset for the first time, Vanessa excitedly combed through the entire game with almost nothing but enthusiasm. Experiencing her favorite series in total immersion was a feeling like no other, and she was having a blast. She was a little disappointed that most of the lore elements were seemingly gutted here, but that was a small price to pay compared to everything else. As she continued, though, she noticed some strange glitches throughout the various levels. Maybe this was some kind of new storyline she was unraveling. After discovering a hidden area within the game, Vanessa was able to piece together Tape Girl's recordings and discover the truth. To her horror, this wasn't just new lore, this was real. Upon this realization, Vanessa felt a shiver down her spine as she turned around to see a certain someone behind her. Oh, that is awesome. I love these little segments where they get this really, like, detailed art style and they show it. Like, they've done this in every episode every so often. It's so fucking good. What the fuck? Is this better? British! After <laughs> British, what the fuck? <laughs> Vanessa took a short break to recover from that scare. She hesitantly put her headset back on and continued testing the game. 
As she played, she noticed that Glitch Trap became more tangible as she found more of Tape Girl's messages. Vanessa was uneasy, but she decided that maybe it would be best to actually talk to the anomaly. Glitch Trap stood before her in relative silence, so she took this as a cue to speak. What started with conversation of her experience testing the game led to her entire interpretation of the FNAF timeline, including every ounce of external media she was aware of. And then when Springtrap found him, he did a spot-on impression of the stepdad and then later stuck him into an oven in Fazbear's Frights, and I think the actual place burned down, but it didn't happen. Who on earth is handsome? Glitchtrap had heard of <laughs> Whatever nonsense Vanessa was recounting was absolutely nothing like what actually happened. So he caught her up to speed on the actual events of his life, from Ferdinand's creation to Afton's amalgamation eradication. Vanessa was over the moon. She never could have anticipated getting such a comprehensive understanding of all of Freddy's history, and she was shocked at how different the real answers were compared to the storyline the FNAF games portrayed. At this point, she decided she wanted to help Glitchtrap somehow escape the game. So, like any rational person, Vanessa decided to let Glitchtrap merge with her mind. Removing her headset, Vanessa now saw William by her side in the real world. Okay, so instead of him taking her over and forcing her to do his bidding, she's just agreed to do his bidding and welcomes the possession. What the fuck? Hey, sorry, man. No, I think the other voice was better, actually. You are so picky. Afton, no, no, she's right. The other voice is better. Inhabiting Vanessa's brain, wasn't keen on being confined in someone else's body again, so he begged her to help him find a new body for himself. After thinking through everything he had told her, Vanessa decided that she'd make her own personalized rabbit suit to keep William quiet while they tried to get him back into a physical form. Because that'd take a while, however, she simply crafted a mask in time for the Halloween festival Freddy's was putting together. Speaking of which, Michael Afton was okay. preparing something big. He had been postponing his plans to make an animatronic father figure long enough, and it was time to finally set things in motion. He needed a perfect vessel, though, something his own father created. After some consideration, Michael took a visit to the graveyard and dug up the original Fredbear's body. He was going to revive what? the animatronic and make him into the perfect- Oh! Sure oh, he he's going to make him into the Frankenstein Freddy! Without reviving an artificial intelligence, Mike figured that obscene amounts of electricity would do the trick. So he crudely stitched Fredbear back together and ran some tests to try and bring him back to life. And it was- Dreadbear, that's his name. It was a success. Michael had let- Right? I believe so. Time slip right past him, though. Fazbear Fall Fest was only in a few days, and he had yet to make the perfect attraction for it. All at once, it dawned on him that he could present the revived animatronic as Fredbear until he could fix him up. Yeah! Sure enough, this worked perfectly, and at long last, Fredbear was the star of the show for the first time in decades. While attending the festival, Vanessa ruminated on her recent life choices. As she half-heartedly participated in the various attractions, William finally learned that Michael was behind all of this. For the first time in his unnaturally prolonged existence, he finally felt somewhat proud of his son. Before he could stew over this new emotion, though, Vanessa accidentally bumped right into the entrepreneur. Vanessa, utterly embarrassed, began to profusely apologize, to which Mike just blankly stared at her, waiting for her to go away. This led to Vanessa rambling once more about her obsession with his company, only this time she had all of William's knowledge at her disposal. Michael, initially uninterested, was taken aback by Vanessa's inexplicable understanding of Fazbear Entertainment's history. After evaluating whether or not to dispose of her, he determined she oh! may be useful and gave her a new job with <laughs> Why do I, why does everyone just bring in a gun to shoot people? Special attention. Vanessa was now part of a security team for a new project Mike was working on, the Fazbear Fun Time Service. This was a special delivery service for Fazbear Entertainment mass-produced replicas. The Five Nights at Freddy's AR, isn't it? This is... Okay, we're getting into the AR. Of ...some of the most iconic characters from the business. I personally never played it. I know of it. I, I didn't really go too deep in it, but what I, my knowledge of it is through what I've seen in um, game theory and whatnot. ...his legacy and rented them out for criminally high prices. Vanessa was fascinated by this concept, and William realized this would be the perfect... Why, Balloon Boy? ...perfect way to get a recreation of his favorite fursuit. So, on Vanessa's first day of security, she hacked into the system with her gamer skills and ordered production of Springtrap animatronics. By the time higher-ups noticed something unusual about this, they all shrugged it off since Springtrap was probably profitable enough to rent out. William was thrilled that his body had been perfectly remade, but he got cold feet once he realized Fazbear Entertainment was producing so much of him. He didn't want to just be another Springtrap in the crowd, he wanted to be in the spotlight. Vanessa was confused about him changing his mind though, and they began to bicker about the integrity of the unique Springtrap. Getting fed up with this, Vanessa tried banging her head against one of the replicas to attempt to transfer. 
This ended up knocking her out, giving William free reign to puppet her body. Knowing this could come in wow. handy in future schemes, he quickly searched how to induce compliance in human subjects to ensure he could do this whenever it benefited him. This, alongside some other concerning web searches, alerted the IT department immediately. Unfortunately, the only guy who cared to contact Vanessa about it, Lewis, was more interested in coffee than figuring out why she wanted to chop people in half. By the time Vanessa came to, she didn't have any recollection of the stunts William was pulling, and simply resumed her normal work activity. Anytime William took control again, though, Lewis would shoot another email wondering why Vanessa wasn't taking the hint. This led to a lot of one-sided conversation and coffee invitations, but outside of that, the Funtime service was doing great. People were renting animatronics constantly, and the funds gained from this inspired Michael to start offering additional characters and quirky variants of the existing ones. <laughs> there was only one problem. Aside from the occasional fatality from letting infamously killer animatronics out in public, delivery tr Jesus. trucks for both animatronics and pizza started being attacked by bears. To Michael's surprise, bears absolutely adored the taste of pizza and despised Fazbear animatronics. This was all thanks to their overlord, Ferdinand von Bernard. Although artificial, Ferdinand he always comes back! <laughs> cosmic power allowed him to integrate perfectly into bear society. His appearance indicated to bears across the world that he was something special for their kind, and he provided them all with wisdom far beyond their years. The most important thing Ferdinand taught them, however, was to hold a grudge against Fazbear Entertainment. Being left behind and replaced by his creators was one thing, but his arch nemesis, Michael, becoming CEO of the company was another. Michael was losing at least five delivery drivers a day from these bear attacks. Lawsuit. <laughs> lawsuits from this was the final straw. So he met with Vanessa in private and brought up her previous security breach on the Fazbear Funtime service. Ah, uh, I see what you did there. Terrified that she'd get fired, but on the contrary, Michael explained that he needed her to covertly program an order for war. After further instruction, Vanessa hacked into the Funtime service yet again to order the animatronics to attack all of bear kind. With just a push of a button, the Great Bear War began. Animatronic and Ursine fiercely clashed against each other within moments. The bears that could react stormed to the front lines wherever they could, and soon- What the fuck did this just turn into? A bear on animatronic war?! Two allies arrived to join them. It was Trevor the Cashier and Harold the Janitor, otherwise known as- THEY'RE STILL AROUND?! HAROLD AND THE CASHIER DUDE?! WHAT THE FUCK?! Shadow Freddy and Rickfus Fosks. Both of them had just been fired from their former jobs at Freddy's, and Michael had completely gutted their pension. Rickfuss Fosks tortured one patron for cheating at Pack and Pal, and that managed to cross the line, apparently. Shadow Freddy didn't want to work at Freddy's without his partner, so Mike fired him too just so he couldn't formally quit. With nothing to lose, Shadow Freddy and Rickfuss Fosks tried to assist the war effort to rebel against Michael. Sadly, as Shadow Freddy attempted to conga line a troop of bears to victory, he was obliterated by a barrage of fireworks. As Shadow Freddy's dark remnants scattered across Hurricane, Rickfuss Fosk's rage grew so powerful that he managed to shut down the Funtime Services servers and end the bloodshed. This was- What? <laughs> what? I, I, what? It was too little too late, sadly, and he set off on a hopeless quest to recollect his partner and bring him back. Ferdinand, discovering Mike had nearly obliterated his people, knew he had to do something to fix this. After phasing through realities to forge the perfect plan, Ferdinand understood what needed to be done. For safekeeping, Ferdinand warped all bears across time and space to a new dimension he called Faradice, and waited for the stars to align in his favor. Now that bears were seemingly extinct, Michael had no what <laughs> real threat to his business. Additionally, his overall corporate success caught the attention of every major company in the country. The power vacuum they all shared from Eleanor's massacre allowed for Mike to- This story has gone way and beyond more and more crazy and, and shocking. ...to buy all of them out for cheap, and Fazbear Entertainment became a mega corporation within the blink of an eye. With this, the stage was finally set for Michael to build the mega pizza plex of his dreams, and Hurricane City Council couldn't say no this time. Michael was proud of Vanessa for her cooperation, and despite her not really being qualified for any promotion, he ordered his board of directors to transfer her to the head of security at the Pizzaplex once construction was complete. <laughs> it would take time for this project to finish, but Michael was absolutely certain that it'd be action was complete. Is that just Henry with a mustache? That looks like Henry was just a mustache. His board of directors to transfer her to the head of security at the Pizzaplex once construction was complete. It would take time for this project to finish, but Michael was absolutely certain that it'd be nothing short of his magnum opus. For now, he was left to contemplate his two personal projects. Dreadbear had been a great novelty for the Fall Fest, but his body's disrepair was not sustainable for a long-term business. So, Mike harvested Dreadbear's AI to use within a brand new animatronic. 
a Glamrock reimagining of Freddy Fazbear. All Mike needed now was to finally use his Fazgoo for its true purpose. With confirmation from Shane Oh, bringing back the Fazgoo stuff, okay. The substance worked. Mike was confident his most unattainable dream would come to fruition. Now, exploring every nook and cranny of Hurricane, he searched for the remnant he had coughed up after the pizza place fire in order to bring his younger brother back. Soon after vaporizing Rick Fosk with a flashlight, Michael finally found what he was looking for. A chaotic energy emanated from the newest remnant deposit he discovered, and he knew he found him. Capturing the remnant and returning home, Michael guided the child's soul to the Fazgoo and watched as the boy was finally put back together. Now that his brother actually existed again, the fog lifted. After all this time, Michael could finally remember the child's name, Gregory Afton. <laughs> They're going over this route. But at the same time, it, it the whole the whole weird thing though is in part 1 didn't like he erase his memory from everybody but Michael and everyone forgot about the crying child. And he was a psychotic son of a bitch too. He murdered people in part 1. On purpose. All right. I hope that's suffice for now. Oh my god, we didn't even get into Security Breach. So we will be getting a part four next year probably, or at some point. Whenever it does drop, please let me know about it. Or if there's any updates on when it's dropping, let me know about Finale's it. Finale's rolling in much faster than this one, and I've got to be prepared. Wait. Finale's Wait. rolling in much faster. Alright, I hope that's suffice for now. The finale's rolling in much faster than this one, and I've got to be prepared. Wait. Finale? Is security breach the end? Yep. Nothing else. No secret up my sleeve. It all ends with... We'll see. Catch you next time. <laughs> I'll be looking forward to that whenever it does drop. Alright then. That was absolutely... What the fuck?! <laughs> But still, I loved it. <laughs> it was wacky, goofy, enjoyable, and and honestly entertaining. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this one. I wasn't expecting the lore and all that stuff to go all the way into the book stuff, the uh, VR slash AR stuff. We technically didn't even like get into everything VR because we still technically have more that they go into. Although they did go into the VR. And they did talk about the, the the Halloween event and everything. So, there's still much more for them to cover in the part four. And I was right. There is going to be a part four in the beginning when I talked about that. So, I'm excited to whenever part four do does drop. Let me know about it. And I'll try to ch check it out as soon as I possibly can. Check out all the other videos on the channel, guys. Plenty of FNAF reactions. Plenty of awesome animations. Plenty of awesome content for you guys to go enjoy on the channel. And I'll see you guys in the next one. I upload every day. I push myself to post two videos every day. And I'll see you in the next one. Till then. Later. Take us on another one!